So I wanted to talk to you about uh, about I love starting with people's foundations, sure. their their roots. So what I call sort of the birth of leadership, um, parents, grandparents, mentors, champions, uh, good experiences, bad experiences that sort of shaped who you are. Could we could we start there? Sure. Um, actually, I grew up in the Bronx, New York. And I would say I was talking with my parents first in the fact that they recognized the importance of education. And my parents, neither one of my, well, my parents had gone to college. So I was the first one in my family to go to college, let alone graduate school on two occasions. But I think more than just school, it's about work ethic. And believing, and I remember the saying, you may not be the smartest person, but no one can outwork you. And I think that's been part of my mindset from a young adult to the present in terms of my ability to show my value in different ways. Because obviously folks have credentials, a lot of folks have great credentials and great schools, but at the end of the day, how do you perform? And I think the second example, I actually had a mentor by the name of Ron Goldsberry when I worked at the Ford Motor Company. I did a presentation and a young lady, a good friend of mine said, Ron wants to talk to you. And because Ford was so big, I had no idea who the gentleman was. At the time, he was a high-ranking African-American at Ford, but he was in the marketing side of Ford, and I was on the finance side. And I remember him saying this, and I, at the time, I may have been a financial analyst, so maybe a low-level manager. He said, one day, you'll be a CFO. And when I heard that, it was, I was so far removed from the CFO ranks. I'm thinking, okay, we'll see when this happens, but I, had, I think I've been out of grad school for about two years and wonder, is it possible, because there was no one like me that I was aware of who was the CFO. And I think the key thing behind that is he said, you have to be really strategic about what steps you take toward your career. Second key thing is, you gotta know when you need to leave an organization to move to the next one to get you your opportunities. Because sometimes you can stay too long in one place and lose opportunities. And the third piece, I think he mentions that you have to be willing to take risk. And what he meant by that, going to a new organization, moving to other parts of the country and taking roles that other folks may not take, but can provide you with a good framework and foundation for future opportunities. And I have to say, looking back on that, he was absolutely right. Because as someone told, what has told me, I would have been the CFO for going on 20 years and now most recently chief operating officer. I wouldn't have guessed that early in my career what it showed was all things are possible if you have a plan. And, and actually, it had nothing to do with a mentor. But when I was at graduate school, I went to MIT for my MBA. And you had to write a thesis. So I wrote a thesis about progression of African-Americans and corporate America. So I contacted every Black leader at that time who was at the C-level to figure out how did they get there. So I saw a couple of common themes. The first one was, if you have a technical background, it's important. Number two, why it's not fair. People look at what school you go to. Um, number three is, are you willing to make a move from city to city? And if you're married or single, will your partner allow you to be that person who can move or not? Because a lot of times, from a career perspective, you may have to move to a new location to get a new opportunity. So those are a couple of things I learned earlier on in my career. And I can say it really materialized down down the road in terms of where I'm at today. Yeah. Let me, I want to ask you one question about what you just said, Ken. Um, when you at, were at MIT and you interviewed these Black executives, do you recall how many they were and how? what is the, uh, the difference between then and now? Unfortunately, it hasn't changed a whole lot in the last 30 years. <clears throat> between, I'll say, CEOs and senior leaders. And because I have to say we're more than just CEOs, everyone was a CEO, but highest level, probably I got 20 responses. Current, and that included the few CEOs that were present. Right now, there's probably no more than four or five currently. I mean, you have, you have one at m and Bank, you have a person uh, most recently at TIA Kreft. Um, but there is, you know, there's a few here and there, but there hasn't been the groundswell I would have hoped of 30 years later. Yeah. unfortunately. Um, but having said that, what I've seen is that a lot of Black entrepreneurs have developed their own skill base and moved up regardless of worrying about 
you know, going through a corporate environment, they created their own. And that's what I've seen that's been a little bit different. So you, you talked about growing up in the Bronx and when approximately is this, Ken? Well, let's see, we, we moved to the Bronx in 69. Okay. And so, so I would say the, the, the 70s and 80s were my primary time between middle school, high school, and then I was in college in the 70s. And then I went to grad school in the 80s. So that was that period. And that was an interesting time. I mean, if you think about the Bronx back in that era, a lot of gang violence was prevalent. Um, drugs were pervasive. So basically, it was important to have parents who allowed us not to be involved. So I, I remember my dad always saved money for my sister and I. So we went to um, summer camp. So we weren't hanging out in the streets. Or making sure we would go down south to visit, and it's funny we I called down south, going to, going to see Pleasant, Maryland. So <laughs> relative to New York, that's south. Yes. And so we were never around the element. It existed, but we weren't involved to an extent. Plus the fact I think given how our parents cared about us, we went, we didn't want to disappoint them. So I think that was a factor. And and where in the Bronx did you live? Yeah, there's a place called Co-op City, and Co-op City was right. a, yeah. it was an experiment, right? It was a it was a man-made experiment. Fifty thousand people lived in thirty-five buildings, and it was one of the few places where, and that, it didn't happen for me because I I got I was relatively older at the time, but you could technically go from elementary school to high school and not leave Co-op City. But I was fortunate in that I went to a middle school. That was near Corp City. And then I was fortunate to get into a specialized high school, the Bronx High School of Science. Okay. So that school really prepared you for college. And what was interesting, you know, some schools, they may ask, are you going to college? At Bronx High School of Science, the question was, what high school were you going to? Very different mindset. And just about every major college came through to really pick the talent there. So it was a really different environment. They prepared us for college. I took calculus in 11th grade, for example. I, I took foreign language for four years. So while New York State had requirements, the specialized high schools in New York actually had requirements that were up and beyond what was required by the city or the state. In, in what years were you in high school? From, 19, from 1970 to 1974. 1974, okay. So tell me, I mean, I'm, I grew up in, in New York as well, so I, I know, but tell me about, you talked about, that's right, the gangs and the drugs and what, what do you, besides those things, looking back on it as, as a person of color, as a black man, yeah. what, do you, what do you recall about being black and young in New York City? Well, in that era, actually, it was very progressive for black folks. It's interesting. I used to be the board chair for a group called AFI, which is the Association of Black Foundation Executives. And when I did a presentation talk about 50 years ago in the 70s, it was a really a great time for black folks. You had black empowerment. You had Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. We actually had songs, Ain't No Stopping Us Now. So you actually had music that were that actually had a message, for example. Um, you actually had folks becoming the first in things, right? So you actually had Black music. You had Soul Train, that was our version of American Bandstand. So you saw a degree of independence and, and being proud of who we were as a people. I remember you had the Black Panthers back then, right? And, and, and folks feared the Black Panthers because they spoke about being proud of who they are. You had Shaft and Superfly back then. So you have movies that talked about an era of Black leadership. And uh, okay, we may, we, Superfly may have been a little bit on the edge because of, of how he looked with his big fancy fur coats, but what it reflected was an era of where you saw Black empowerment. I think the other key thing was back then, you saw which I wish I see more now, you still saw parents really working in a sense of community with their children. So I couldn't do anything wrong because not, the, not my parents, but other parents would say, no, you can't do that. So you actually had that sense of community amongst black children that I wish we would have today. So you actually had that, that village. So we had that piece. And then more importantly, I think it was okay to be smart. You know, uh, right now, this era, you know, folks feel peer pressure if I can't have a brain, but they, folks admired you if you felt you were going to make a difference or be that first one to go to college. So I think that era was, was different in that regard. And then you hit the music. I mean, folks remember, that's where hip hop started in, yeah. in the 70s, in the Bronx, for, for that matter. 
And so you actually had music. So long before you had the music, you had groups like Last Poets that actually had poetry, which was really the precursor to hip hop music when that music really had more of a message. It wasn't about profanity or disrespecting women. It was about a storytelling about their community. So those are things I remember most. And then I think, I think the other key thing was the fact that I saw that when I first went to college, there were, I remember going to Boston University as an undergrad and seeing affluent black folks for the first time and recognizing I've never seen folks like that before. They did exist. You know, driving Mercedes and wearing fur coats and they were freshmen in college and growing up in New York, I didn't even own a car. You know, I had a bus pass. <laughs> so to see the fact that what was possible was something that, that still was ingrained with me that if you work hard and do what you need to do, that too can be possible for you. So those are the things I remember most. And in terms of your parents, I mean, you were younger, but in terms of people like Malcolm X and then Dr. King and, you know, the assassination of, of President Kennedy's, uh, President Kennedy and the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, did that have any impact on you and, and, and the family? Oh, yeah, I, oh, definitely. I remember when, when Martin Luther King died and was assassinated because I was 11 at the time. And I remember my parents were sad and I was sad and was like, and then, you know, shortly thereafter, you had to have an assassination of a Kennedy. And I'm thinking, what kind of country do we have that someone speaks their mind versus having a different point of view, you kill someone. And, and you know, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, you know, there's a void in black leadership for a period of time because he was such a strong figure, you know, who was leading that effort next. And then you have Malcolm X who was killed. And even though him and King had different points of view, they were still leaders he gets assassinated. So it made me wonder, as a black person, if you speak your mind, is that the byproduct of, of being honest and being authentic of who you are? Mm. And, and is that something that, that you talked about with your parents? Yeah, because I mean, to give an example, when I first went to Boston University in 1974, that's the year they started busing in Boston, a very dramatic time. And I remember being called the N-word, <laughs> Um, and not necessarily from the students, but just from the community, because they, you know, they felt as if they were better. And, you know, this person get an education, they must think we're better. I just went there to get an education, but I could see the, the behaviors in many folks who were wondering about the fact that you were educated. And what, what I remember most, I said, no one's going to stop me from my education. You can, you can say what you want, but it's too important. And I think particularly in that era when we look at King, we look at Malcolm and others, I think many of my friends and colleagues, fraternity brothers and the like, we all recognize we won't let anything stop us from graduating because we knew it was important for our community to get that piece of paper. Yeah. So that's what I remember most. So you talked about, I think you had said, you, you, were you the first in your family to go to college? Yeah, out of my immediate family now. Well, let me ask you that before you go on. So tell me then, when did that become apparent to you that you were going to college? You know, when did your parents sort of clarify that or did they clarify it? Or you, you just sort of said to yourself, I'm going to college. I, I think or, I automatically knew that. I mean, first of all, um, my parents recognized I was always strong analytically. So, for example, when we lived in Manhattan before we moved to the Bronx, I would skip the year. So I went from the fourth grade to the sixth grade. And then I, was, I got one of the highest math awards when I was in middle school. So, and then once I went to the Bronx High School of Science, it was never a conversation because it was just assumed you were going to college. I never thought about it as something special. But what I do remember was the fact, and I still remember this like yesterday, when I graduated from Boston University, my dad was pretty laid back. I remember the tear coming down his face because I knew how important it was for him to see a black man, particularly his son, graduate. Yeah. And I still I still remember that. That was night that was May 5th, 1978. I still remember that date like it was yesterday. That's fantastic. And what I and what I ended up doing, just to let you know, until maybe the last 10 years, all my degrees were at my parents' house. I never had them in my house until about 10 years ago. Because I wanted them to see their hard work was generated in those pieces of paper that I had received. Yeah. 
So you talked a little bit about your parents. I'd like to talk a little more about that. But did um, influences your grandparents, for example, were there any influences on that level, Ken? I would say my grandmother on my mom's side. Um, she actually had an interesting life. She was part of that era back in the 20s. And what I, I liked about my grandmother, she lived down in Sea Pleasant, Maryland. She could see what was good in all of us. And she could see that we all have potential, but all in different ways. So she could recognize within all her grandchildren what they had to offer. And it was interesting how she was so insightful on who we are and what we would end up doing. And that part was particularly important. <clears throat> My great great grandfather was influential. He actually never went to college or anything, but he lived to be 107. <laughs> so so when I was born, he was 80 years old. So when he passed, I was 27. So I remember a joke with him saying, what, what, how, how are you able to live so long? He said, because I take care of myself. I take care of my mind. And he said, I may not be educated in terms of school-wise, but I will always read. I will always learn. I will always find out things. So he was never stagnant in his thinking. And I, and I thought about that, that in life. You graduate, but that's just the beginning of your education. It doesn't end with a degree or a diploma. Yeah, and that's fascinating. Did um, were you able to uh, sit down with him and talk about his life? Where was he from? He was originally from South Carolina. Okay, and he came up north, but he lost touch with all his other siblings. And I guess with the, with the situation down there, he probably needed to escape, so he came up north. And then he actually had four children, and he outlived half of his children because he lived so long. But what I remember most, he shared the fact that if you keep on walking, you keep on learning, you will always survive. And it's only maybe up to the last six months of his life that he actually got sick. So, so I would meet with him every time I would come home from a, let's say a break from school. And I remember I would come up, he lived up in New Rochelle um, and he was living with his son and, and his wife and so forth. I would go to his room. I would give him some ginger snaps, um, a couple of bananas, and we would watch Yankee baseball games. <laughs> and we would play checkers. And that's what I learned to play checkers from. Okay. from so did he, have, did he have stories or did he, did he talk about his family's life, his parents and grandparents in terms of slavery, in terms of maybe where the family came from, from Africa? Did he, did he have any not, not, recollections not, about that? Not too much. I think it was probably too painful. Okay. Which is why he didn't talk about that much. So he was more talking about the present and the future than the past, because that's why it took a while for us to find out where he was from originally in South Carolina. And was, I, I was probably older when I asked him, I said, and his name was Cyrus Duvois, and, but we called him Pop. I said, Pop, were you always in New York? He said, no, I was in South Carolina. But until I asked him, he never really volunteered it. So I think there was a lot of pain at that yeah. time and he didn't want us to experience that pain okay i, I truly believe that yeah yeah well obviously yeah it's uh, it's painful i don't have to tell you obviously you know reading about our ancestors and everything yeah. they went through is painful it's painful now yeah. um, and I, I didn't have to live through it we didn't have to live through it so that's exactly. I, I certainly understand that so all right so you've got your your, your grandfather you got your parents were there any other people in the community that sort of um, spurred you on growing up prior to going to college? Ken? Well, I, th I think in general, growing up in Corp City, there weren't that many black families there. So I think all the families in general rooted for us as young men and women to progress with our careers. So I have my friend Curtis Archer right now. He's the president of the Harlem um, development zone in Harlem, or my friend Mark Harrison, who's a lawyer down in D.C., or my friend Kevin, who, who became a, a physician working out of Queens, New York. And these are just some examples here, but what was critical is that we actually had all the family units collectively really spurring us on and really <clears throat> making us recognize the importance of education. And even for those children who didn't go to college, their parents still spurred us on because two things, they want us to do well, but also want to set example for those who didn't go and why you should go. So I think it serves two different purposes in that regard. 
Yeah. I uh, see so you said there weren't that many black families. So most of the families were white, Hispanic, Jewish. Jewish. <laughs> okay. Initially, when Cook City first opened in 69, I would say it was probably 70% Jewish, um, 30% of all, all the white ethnicities, Italian and so forth, and 10% other, which have been black and, and wow, we, what we call now Latinx. Okay. And probably more black than Latinx. There weren't that many Latino families back then. Now it's completely different now. It's primarily black and Hispanic, but back then it was, it was relatively small. And what was the interaction like with the, with the Jewish families? It, it was fine, actually. Um, I played Little League Baseball, um, a Corp City League, and the team was pretty diverse back then. And I didn't see much in terms of racism or anything. For the most part, I didn't say it didn't exist, but very rarely for the most part. Um, Corp City was a relatively safe neighborhood, which is why I think I, my parents wanted us to live there. But I think we, we got along. I mean, there were different um, types of folks there, but I didn't feel as if we were unwanted there. I, I can safely say that. So obviously you have you know, these academic achievements growing up and you head off to Boston and University. And I'm going to ask you why you chose that. But uh, that conversation that so many Black fathers have with their Black sons about going out in the world uh, and dealing with race and racism what was that, uh, you know, leaving Co-op City? So it was fairly safe. Bronx School of Science, very good. What kind of conversation did your, your parents have, particularly your dad, when you went to, uh, to Boston, Ken? Well, I think the key thing was keep focus on why you're there. And don't let anything stop you from accomplishing why you're going there. And the reason why that's important when I first got to Boston, there was a situation in Faneuil Hall when an African-American was hit with a flagstaff the first week I was there. I still remember that. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, I had never seen anything like that for any person of color. And then recognizing that for many African-Americans, particularly in Boston, they felt subservient to white folks in terms of how they behaved. And I wasn't used to being subservient to anybody. <clears throat> and then recognizing I still remember this. I think it was orientation. And a group of us, one of my friends had a car and drove. And we didn't know where we were, but I remember we stopped at a red light. And, and, I, and I made a comment. I said, I feel an air of hostility. <laughs> I don't know where we are, but we need to turn around. Yeah. And we were back then with the South Boston, which back then was a pretty racist part of Boston. Yes. And thankfully we got out of Dodge because you could you could sense it. I remember we stopped the light and you had and I could feel folks staring at the vehicle. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't have to be here. Yes, gotcha. No, I understand. I understand. Um, so why why Boston University? Well, initially, it's funny, initially I was thinking about going to Northwestern. Okay. But I think a couple of factors. Um I got accepted to Stanford, Northwestern, Fordham, and BU. Well, I didn't want to go to Fordham because it was right around the corner from my high school. So I'm like, I'm not going that close. <clears throat> I really thought about Stanford and Northwestern, but was really funny. My mom being the mom, oh, you're too far from home. And she really getting concerned about that. My dad was really different. My dad said, you should go wherever you want to. And I think two factors selected like Boston University. It was four hours from New York. I could take the Amtrak up. And the big reason, in addition with the fact they did a really good job in terms of financial aid. And I was trying to be conscientious knowing that I had a sister. We were two and a half years apart age-wise, but four years apart grade-wise. So I said, if I could <clears throat> save money for my parents, academically, that'd be a good thing. And BU had all, you no, know, it was a pretty big university. So you had all the majors you know, that has sports. Um, and because it was a large school, even though the black population was 5%, you still had a decent population because the actual population of the institution was pretty big. Okay. And so, and then Boston is a college town. So you actually, I mean, outside of BU, there were parties and events and other campuses from week to week. So you never got bored. Right. But also the potential to get distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Point well taken. Thankfully, I did not. I mean, you have. I mean, the, I tell folks you have to be um, distract yourself to a point. 
yeah. as I phrase it. When, when you can't distract yourself to the point where your grades will suffer. Right. En enjoy the experience. Being a, a college student is about more than just the academics. Mm -hmm. But you can't call it party, party central either, because right. if you do, you will be leaving as quickly as you got there. So you talked about when you when you arrived there in Boston, you know, busing was starting. Yeah. Um, in terms of the school itself, you mentioned the population was about five percent black. Were there a lot of um, interaction between blacks and whites? What was sort of the, the the racial situation there at Boston University when you got there, Ken? I think, I think for the most part, it was interaction, but pretty minimal, in my opinion. I think most of us or folks of color, we hung amongst ourselves for the most part. Because I still think, you know, society wasn't ready for influx of black folks getting educated, particularly at the white institution. So I'm not saying there was zero interaction, but not like if I compare it to now, I think there's significantly more interaction amongst races because you have more children who are biracial, for example. So there's much more inclusion in most parts of the country. Um, so it wasn't as inclusive versus even when I was in high school. My high school was predominantly Jewish and Asian. It was probably more interaction in my high school, quite frankly, than it was in college. <clears throat> but because we actually had a population of friends, we didn't concern ourselves with that. As long as you had the, the right folks hanging out with you and educating with you, we, we, didn't, we didn't sweat it, quite frankly. Okay. So when did you decide, well, first of all, what did you major in? And when did you sort of decide that was what you wanted to go for? Long story, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Actually, undergrad, I was a psychobiology major. Psychobiology, okay. Yeah. And the goal was, I thought I was going to go to dental school. And actually, after I graduated, I actually went to University of Buffalo for dental school. Hmm. I went for two years, and I remember I was carving this plastic tooth and said, I'm going to do this for the next 40 years of my life. And I, and I, and I realized I didn't want to do that. It didn't excite me, so I actually left the dental school program and then got a master's at, at New, University of Buffalo in applied economics. And then behind that, I had my first corporate job working at Prudential in New Jersey. And I liked, that was more what I enjoyed doing. So I was there for about three years. And then afterwards, it said to move further within the organization, you have to get your MBA. So I said, if that's the case, I'm not going to go to school full time because I actually went to school full time and worked full time when I got my master's in applied economics. I said, I can't do that again. And I didn't have a life. I mean, it was like daytime work, nighttime school. So I said, if, that, if I'm going to go back to school, I'm going to choose which schools I'm going to go to. So I got I was fortunate to get into all the programs that I applied to, but I picked the Sloan School at MIT because I wanted international development. I knew they was drawing in finance and I enjoyed it. So I think it was actually once I worked at Prudential, quite frankly, that I recognized that would be my path moving forward. So I, I got to ask you, Ken, why, in terms of the idea of you wanted to be a dentist, you got to talk you, you and, and where you are now, you got to explain to me, what was your, what was your thinking back then that that was something that, uh, that was appealing to you? Well, I remember when we lived in Manhattan, going to the dentist and recognizing a lot of black men and women weren't getting appropriate um, health care in terms of dentistry. Okay. And one reason being this an inherent fear of dentists, right? Because folks affiliate dentistry with, with um, providing pain, right? You know, you get a needle in your mouth or the extracting the tooth and pulling something out. But on the flip side, if you don't go to the dentist, you have other issues later on in life. So I said, if I could help my community by being a dentist, that'd be a way of giving back because I didn't have a fear of a dentist. <clears throat> and I said, what things could I teach other folks so that way Normally, if you take care of your teeth, you go twice a year, you get a cleaning, um, you know, they may take out some plaque, um, but you may have to get braces possibly, but, but overall, it shouldn't be a bad experience. But back then, dentistry back then actually had this um, feeling of fear to a lot of folks. Okay. So I thought maybe I could be a change agent in that regard. That's what had me think about it. And, and, I, and because I like math and science too, right? I went to science high school, so it kind of fit as well. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. So 
you you're there at Prudential. Now, are you at Prudential when you go to MIT? No, actually, I had I had graduated from the University of Buffalo. Then I worked at Prudential. I went there for uh, I worked at Prudential full time, and then after being there for three years, I left there to go to MIT to the Sloan School. Okay. And obviously, MIT is such a, a phenomenal place. Talk talk a little bit about how long you were there, just some of your experiences in MIT, Ken. Sure. I was there from 87 to 89. Okay. And at the time, my class had 185 students. There were three African-Americans in my class. And I remember talking to the dean, because I remember walking into orientation and thinking, I cannot be the only Black person in here. <laughs> I remember looking around, also the black gentleman. I said, you don't know this yet, but you're gonna be my roommate. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, why? I said, well, I went to school in Boston undergrad and, and the rent prices here are exorbitantly high. <clears throat> so he decided to become my roommate. And so I think it was about a week or two after I got there, we get a chance to meet the Dean. So I asked him a really honest question. I said, no disrespect. I'm happy to be here, I, but I do have a question for you. How were you able to find 22 Japanese from Japan, but only three black Americans in the US? Yeah. And the lesson I learned from that, asking that question, he said, you're right. But he said, help me find a solution. So, and so the first lesson I learned is when you raise a problem, you should also try to have an answer. Yeah. And what I ended up doing, I started the Minority Business Club at MIT for the Sloan School because I felt folks needed a sense of community. And then as I said, you gotta find a way to provide great financial aid because if you can get into a top five program and you provide financial aid, you may get more students to come. And then he gave us funds to go to the National Black MBA Conference. So we actually had a booth for MIT and I wanted to show folks, guess what? You go to MIT, you don't have to be an engineer. I'm, I am not an engineer. Because I think the school had a stereotype of, unless you're an engineer, that's not a school you go to. Right. And so I think those were the factors. And I have to say, I enjoyed my time at MIT. It was small enough class back then. It's really grown since then. I think they have like 800 students now, but back then it was under 200. So I got to know everybody. And, and for example, I was in Ghana back in August. I saw one of my old classmates, Charles Kofi, African gentleman, who was in the class with me and and I said, there's no way I can go to Ghana and I say hi to him. He'll talk about me if I went all the way to Accra and didn't even say hi. And we ended up going to dinner and, and recollecting our time there. Yeah. But I think what was beautiful about the experience is the fact that because MIT wouldn't have developed the programs as Wharton or, 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 or HBS, I was able to create something new there in terms of having the business club Minority Business Club at the time. So there were three black folks and two Latinx folks. That, that's the five of us in my class. The class before us had four. So all nine of us were in both classes. But I also helped in terms of recruitment. So if anyone scored above a certain score in the GMAT score, I sent them a personal letter to at least look at the MIT and consider applying. Yeah. So it's more active engagement. Yeah. And if I, look, if I fast forward now, the diverse representation has increased significantly at MIT. Now they've broken up where they have a Latinx group and, a, and I think called an African heritage group. But they're so big that they don't have to be one group, they could be separate groups because they have enough critical mass that they could break up, which I think is a good news story. Yeah. So you graduate in 89 uh, yeah. from MIT, and then what do you do, Ken? My first job is at the Ford Motor Company. I was an intern at Ford over the summer and I had never lived in the Midwest. So I was an intern. So, so my attitude was, and my dad said the same thing. He said, see if you like it. If you don't like it, you can always come back to New York. So I was an intern that summer. And at the end of the summer, I was actually offered a job opportunity for the full year. But I said, let me at least go into the interview process and really determine whether I want to come back to Michigan. Well, after going through the interviews, a lot of it was banking companies. And I'm not sure if I want to do banking. So and Ford had a great reputation for finance development. So I said, let me go to the Midwest. But what I was fortunate of doing is that when I started, you start at an assembly plant. So I actually pushed him. I said, I want, I want to go to the assembly plant down in Atlanta. 
and they made it happen, right? They said, I don't know if we got someone there. I said, I really want to go to the assembly plant in Atlanta. So I figure one thing I've learned until you offer, take a job, you have leverage. So I put the leverage. So I ended up being there for about nine months. I got promoted and moved to Michigan. And actually I was there close to 10 years. And I, I must have got promoted like seven times and I did a lot of rotations. So I got to see a little bit of everything. And so it was, great, it was great grounding for me to see different aspects of finance and different ways, both on the local level, a national level, and also internationally, because I actually worked on a program that was based out of the UK. Okay. So that was actually a pretty cool assignment, but I decided to leave because one thing about a, a durable product like that, you're going to have peaks and valleys. So I knew that the most entry had it. I, when I got there, it was in the valley, hit a peak, I could see the other valley coming. So I said, probably time. Plus, I don't want to be pigeonholed just to automotive. And had I stayed too long, the only industries that would probably hire me in the future would have been automotive or maybe aerospace. Okay. So I had to be strategic about assuring that I wouldn't be stuck in one industry. All right. So then after Ford, in terms of the strategy, what you're thinking, uh, what happens then after Ford? Where do you think you where do you want to go? Well, I ended up working for what was originally Warner Lambert, which was a diversified pharmaceutical company. And what was interesting is that while it was a pharmaceutical company, they were diversified. So I actually worked for their confectionery group. And those said, a, 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 a pharmaceutical company worked for a confectionery group? I said, yeah, they actually made, and you'll laugh at the product, they made chiclets and dentine and tried it and bubblicious. Okay. And all, all right? So within a year after I start there, Warner Lambert gets acquired by Pfizer. And while it was intentional, I'm asked to take over the European operations to convert all the Warner Lambert system to Pfizer. So I moved to Manchester, England. So actually it was, it was helpful professionally and personally. I always wanted to do an international assignment to get that experience. But separately, my dad was in the military and he actually had two children from a white British woman at that time. He lost touch with her, but years later, my brother rediscovered my, my dad as well as my older sister. Well, I got to meet them when I was there. Wow. So, and so they lived in Liverpool and Liverpool to, to Manchester is like going from Baltimore to Washington, DC. So I remember him meeting me. I still remember the story. So I get to Manchester International Airport and his name is Philip. We see each other and we look very similar. And, and we joke about this now. I said, Philip, we look alike except for the fact that you have an accent. And he goes, Ken, you're in the UK, you have the accent. <laughs> <laughs> so what was interesting, I went from having one niece, which is my younger sister who's still in New York, to having eight nieces and nephews between my brother and sister in England and my younger sister living in New York. Wow. So over the course of those three years, I got to know family and they got to know their American side of the family. Yeah. So it was just a great experience, just reconnecting in that manner. Yeah. And was, was your dad able to come over? Did uh, take Yeah, you? actually, actually, one of my, I guess it would have been one of my nieces got married. So my parents came over and they stayed with me in Manchester and they were able, my dad was able to reconnect with his son and daughter. And the way I looked at it, I shared it with my dad. I said, dad, you have enough love to go around. Yeah. Right. I said, I've, I've been happy to have you. My sister was happy to have you our whole lives. They'll be happy to have you for the rest of the time that you're alive. Because I, I could imagine not growing up, not seeing your dad. So I think it meant a lot to my brother and to my sister. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's, that's wonderful, Ken. Um, so you're there in Manchester. How many Black executives are roaming around Manchester at that particular time? I was the only one. That's an easy question. I was the only one. All right. So um, what was that like? Actually better than anticipated. I think England, at least at that time, and hopefully it's true today, didn't have the type of racism that we experienced in the U.S. So they recognized me as a, they, they talked about me more being American than me being Black, quite frankly recognizing why do you guys call football soccer, for example? Do you know what cricket is? Oh, yeah. Of course, like, cricket isn't played in the U.S. But I would say I had a good working relationship with all the colleagues here. They looked at me as an employee like them with a different role, but I never felt 
any disdain in terms of what I looked like. And, it was, and, I, and it made me think about why my dad and, and a lot of folks in the military, I mean, my dad would share the story with me, why a lot of times they didn't want to um, exit the military to come back to the U.S., but they had freedom in Europe that they didn't experience in the U.S. Yes. And I got a sense of that being there for a period of time, saying, I, I understand what my dad was talking about. Um, but yeah, I didn't feel anything, people treat me badly or anything. They were always friendly, uh, invited me to go into the pub with them or going to events. So they were very inclusive. Terrific. So then how did you make the move from the pharmaceutical confectionery corporation <laughs> end up into philanthropy? Well, well, actually, um, afterwards, and I'll just say briefly, I worked for a, when I left from Pfizer, I worked for an energy trading company in, in Atlanta called Mirren Corporation. And we were doing well until Enron hit. And then Enron, unfortunately, did inappropriate accounting practices, which impacted the whole sector. So by then, and I should also mention when I was with Pfizer, so I have to take over there. Then I go to Mirren. Then we actually have a company filing for bankruptcy protection. So I'm thinking, I've seen more things in terms of job security that I'm trying to avoid. So I was fortunate enough to be contacted um, by a recruiter to actually work at Johns Hopkins. And the role to be the CFO of a division at Johns Hopkins, Coach of Pygo, which is their international NGO. So that's my first time working for a nonprofit. So that's what got me into the nonprofit sector originally. So I worked for five years and I liked the opportunity, but then later on, there was a job opportunity at Anna E. Casey. And I thought that'd be interesting because when I was working for an NGO, it's always about a matter of how do you raise money to keep yourself sustainable. Working for a philanthropic organization, you have the money, it's a matter of giving it out. So there was a, a safety net, which I enjoyed. And because I had CFO experience working at, at Hopkins, I was able to generate that opportunity to be in CFO at Andy Casey. And, and what I found both at Hopkins and both at Casey, I think they went to someone who had the discipline of a corporate finance, but the demeanor of a mission-driven person. And I think because I fit both of those criteria, I actually enjoyed the work. And that's what got me initially into philanthropy. And I actually worked at Casey for 11 years. And what's unique about being a CFO for a, a nonprofit or, in, or an NGO or philanthropic organization, I think the title is misleading because you're not just a finance person, you're the IT person. I'm the grants management person. I'm the event planning person. I'm the building manager. So I had a myriad, and for a while I was also the HR person. So I had a myriad of responsibilities under my purview. Interesting. So, so when do you arrive at the MacArthur Foundation? <clears throat> it was actually October 15th, 2019. Okay. So it's been a little bit over three years. And quite frankly, I wasn't looking to make a move. And it's a true story. I actually... I was the board chair for AFI, which is the Association of Black Foundation Executives. We actually had a leadership meeting in Chicago, developing the next level of talent. And the MacArthur Foundation offered the 17th floor for us to have a reception. So while I'm there, I go visit the CFO there who's about to retire. And I said, congratulations, I heard you're retiring. Since I happen to be in Chicago, I just wanted to congratulate you. So I walk out and the CEO at the time said, you should apply for his job. And I'm thinking, I have a job. <laughs> not, you know, I'm not thinking anything about it. So, you know, I'm in Baltimore, you know, the job's in Chicago. So I, I think nothing of it. Then a few months later, a recruiter contacts me and saying, you know, they're prospecting a new president. I think they had an idea who the president was going to be, but what they were suggesting is that I think the president would look for someone who has experience because this person won't necessarily have philanthropic experience. <clears throat> so probably wouldn't that be a good thing to have a new president and a new CFO who have minimal experience within the philanthropic sector. So that's intriguing to me. And then it coupled with the fact that the MacArthur Foundation was larger by three times the size of any case in terms of their endowment size. But what was most interesting, two of the folks who interviewed me, they knew me because we were on board together. And why is that important? They got to know me as a person versus a piece of paper, right? Everybody can have nice resumes, right? And you can get, you get your resume produced by someone professionally if that's what you want, but they got to see who I was as a person. 
And by seeing that, it engaged me. So I said, okay, maybe I could do this. And that's, and, and then lo and behold, I actually, let me backtrack a second. Before I took the job, I said I should meet the new CEO. So he was actually the headmaster at Andover in Andover, Mass. So I flew up to Boston and we talked for about three hours. And we were immediately in sync. It was something about the conversations. I could work for this person. And even now, we look at it as a partnership, right? Now as if I'm reporting to him, even though I do, it's a partnership. And I was fortunate back in August of this year being promoted from CFO to Chief Operating Officer and Chief Equity Officer. And I became the number two person to him in, in that role. So it also suggested that he believed in my work ethic and my ability to get the job done and really leans on me as a thought partner. So that's how it started. And that's where I'm currently landing as well. That's fantastic. So tell me about, I wanted to talk about philanthropy in terms of, uh, you know, if you're a young person, um, and I think you mentioned this to me that, uh, you know, black Americans are, you know, we, we are, we're almost born philanthropists that we give a lot of our monies away to help others. But if you're, if you're a young person, most people, most people of any color aren't really f- familiar with, you know, the philanthropic world. So could you talk about if a young person wanted to get exposure in that regard or wanted to pursue a profession, what would be some advice you would give them, Ken? A couple of things. Um, first off, a couple of schools are starting to provide philanthropy as majors. So, for example, at Bowie State in Maryland, they're actually starting a program in philanthropy. I'm actually doing a presentation um, there on January 9th, but they actually have guest speakers talk about different aspects of philanthropy. This, this, this is the first year of their program that just started. You actually have the Lilly program in the, um, at Indiana University, as an example. And more importantly, a lot of young people have a social consciousness. So there actually are majors or at least classes that they're taking that weren't existing when I was in school. The second thing is, there's a lot of great websites to look at. For example, there's the Council and Foundation site that can talk about the types of jobs you have in philanthropy as an example. Um, the third thing is that I've been working to really have discussions with programs to say for a young black person, there's a group called Management Leadership for Tomorrow that's run by John Rice, for example. And I met with those two to talk about the types of opportunities that exist in philanthropy. And, and they were shocked because I think folks think of nonprofits under one rubric and they were amazed at the sophistication. For example, I mentioned we have an investment team there. Okay. I said, yeah, I said, yeah, because I said, we don't, I said, a private foundation doesn't raise funds through gifts. They actually have an endowment and they got to grow the endowment faster than they spend. So I think part of that is educating them. What I've done from time to time, if I'm meeting with folks, I'll talk about how I got into philanthropy and why I've enjoyed it. Because what I enjoy about it is the fact that I'm going back to communities that I could relate to. And, and the thing is, regardless of your political affiliation, there's some common threads that you can identify. And, and what I like about the job, which I share with young folks, you can see the impact immediately in the communities that you serve. So nothing gets my work to automotive for cars or pharmaceuticals or insurance. <clears throat> but in this type of career path, you can see the impact of your work. And I, I find when you tell young people about that, it resonates with them. The other thing we've done, particularly with college students, uh, we did this at any case, we're also doing this at MacArthur, really push for internships. So I think this past year at MacArthur, I think we had 13 interns, the bulk of them were diverse um, young people. And the good thing is whether they decide to move further or not, they could tell their friends about that experience over the summer. So, this is, so I figure peer conversations are particularly powerful because I remember the young lady that, one of the young ladies who worked with me this past summer, she was an Asian woman. And she was like, I had no idea all the guys, all the things you guys do. And she said, and she said, oh, I, I may consider doing it. She wants to go to law school, but she said, maybe after I finish law school, I'd like to work for a foundation. But before that, she had no idea about mm-hmm. that. And I can tell you that when we had the most recent application, the number of applications over the last few years has, has increased. So the word is getting out slowly but surely about foundations being an opportunity area. It wasn't true. And then the last thing I did was, I think it was at Concordia College, New York, when it was open, I did a presentation 
there about five years ago, and I share with them, particularly if you're from New York, the number of large private foundations in New York City. And folks recognize the largest number of jobs that are available in the US economy come from nonprofits. Mm. So, and I would say particularly for private foundations, it's probably more job security than there are in other fields. Because I remember when I went to MIT in 1987, April was I think October that year, they had that Black Monday and they were laying all those banking folks out. One of my friends had graduated from Wharton, he was working there for two months, got let go. Well, I said, you could do great work. You'll get paid pretty decent. Okay, okay. I may not be Wall Street rich, but at least I have a lifestyle balance. So I have a balance, right? And there's something to be said for that. So I think once you share and then talk about the work that we do, which I share with young folks, like we have, like I'm the board chair of the Mission Investors Exchange and that does impact investing. So I'll talk about examples, how we'll use investment dollars to maybe help with housing in a lower income neighborhood. So that way folks who are renters now can become owners. Well, when you share a story like that, they could resonate with a community which may have never owned a house. Yeah. Recognize what's possible. And we talk about the neighborhoods that we go through, right? We're not going to Aspen neighborhoods, we're going to disenfranchised neighborhoods. So we're going right to those communities where they need the greatest. So I think when they hear the storytelling, it really resonates with many of those populations of folks. Uh, that haven't had any idea, because you're right. When I was in school, philanthropy, I had no idea what that was. It, it was never discussed. Right. So is there, in terms of preparing for a career in the philanthropic world, uh, if you go to college, are there any recommendations of, of what, the, what types of things you should major in, or does it make a difference? What would you sort of say, Ken? Well, it depends what you want to do in philanthropy. Like if you're on the programmatic side, for example, I see folks and or advocacy, let's say advocacy first, if advocacy is I find a lot of folks who are who are more in the legal profession tend to do well in the advocacy part because you're doing a lot of work, maybe talking about decisions and items. I think on the programmatic side, it could be a numerous number of majors. It could be psychology, sociology, it could be social work, depending on the type of foundation you're working for. Because that's the thing about foundations. It depends on the type of foundation. Okay. If you're on the administrative side, I would say, Finance would never hurt. Um, IT, their jobs. And investments, right? Because if you go to large foundations, you can get paid pretty well. They have a bonus structure just like a, corpor like a corporation. And, 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 and while I tell folks, if you don't believe it, look at the 990 PS. Look at some of the salaries folks are making, particularly for large private foundations. You'll be shocked. I mean, right now, you have folks who are CIOs making $1 and $2 million a year. Hmm. And you were like, really? Right? And they don't have the same stress that yeah. they have on Wall Street. And why can't you tell that? Because they tend to last in the job a long time. Our attrition rates are, are significantly low, right? The biggest chance we have in philanthropy is that if you wait for promotions, you have to wait for someone to leave or retire. Yeah. Because folks aren't leaving. Yeah. That's terrific. No, that's, that's a lot of, lot of great advice. Yeah. Um, and then so in terms of this going back a few grades, in terms of high school kids, you mentioned a website um, and some other information that the young people could go to. Uh, in terms of, do you take interns or, or do foundations take interns from high school students? Well, I, when, we, when I was at Annie Casey, we did through a couple of programs. Now the work wasn't as sophisticated, but what we tried to do, they got access to talk to everyone and more importantly, they got to see the work itself. We do a little bit at McArthur, but not to the same extent. Um, but what we're starting to do is find things that are applicable to a, a high school student that they could do work-wise and gain the experience of how to be in, in a work environment, for example, how to dress, how to show up on time. At the same time, what we do with those young people, whether it's high school, college, or graduate school, we have a lot of access to programs while they're there. So we'll let them see what's happening with our work. And I find that's the part that's particularly fascinating. And I know we did at Casey, we do something at MacArthur. And one of the things I've been pushing that more foundations should do the same thing. And I'm starting to see a lot of pickup in that regard as well. Okay. So one of the final questions is, why do you, I assume, because you're always smiling, that you love your job. And so my question to you is, why? Oh, I, I think it's easy for me a couple of reasons. First of all, I truly believe 
philanthropy is one of the few sectors where black and brown folks do have an opportunity to make it to the C-suite. So for example, I think, don't quote me on the numbers, but I think there's probably be 50 or 60 African-American CEOs in philanthropy. Um, the fact that I've been in philanthropy as a CFO or now CEO for 15 years, what would have been the probability of that happening for me if I was in corporate America? Probably same, same person. Well, what I've had the same opportunity. I think the third piece is that because we're not as big as a lot of corporations, we actually have a chance for much more input in terms of conversations. We're allowed to go to a lot of conferences. We're allowed to be more authentic in, in our conversations as well because we're talking about people issues. And that part I enjoy. I remember when I first started MacArthur, um, the president of MacArthur asked me, I want you to talk to staff about how it is to be a black man in America. Now, what's the chance of me hearing that in a corporate environment? So I talked about the talk when I was younger, when my dad would tell me if I was in the car and holding the steering wheel a certain way. Right. And if you stop by a police officer, excuse me, officer, can I help you? Make sure your wallet is out before they show up so they don't think you're going for a fictitious gun and shoot you. <clears throat> and basically, how do you make it out alive? And I remember afterwards, a lot of my cousins had no idea because they see me as a CFO or CRO. They didn't think as a person I'd ever been stopped by the police or anything that because of what I looked like. But they built a conversation that maybe we wouldn't have existed. And then lastly, the philanthropic sector, which is unique, is that it's the only sector I've ever worked in that we open source. So for example, I just went to a conference in Boston two weeks ago with a lot of CFOs and CROs. We share information on what other folks are doing because we're not competing. So if someone's doing something that I'm not aware of, I can contact a colleague and say, how did you do this? Who did you use? Or conversely, they'll contact me because we're all here for the same reason. And the reason being, people understand, what does the word philanthropy mean? The word is a Greek word means to love of mankind. So we go all there with the same purpose in mind of helping mankind with respect to the missions of our respective organizations. So for me, those are the reasons that I enjoy. And then the last thing that's interesting is like, I like the fact that my work has a lot of diversity. Like if I was working for a corporation and you see a you're just doing finance. Well, I'm doing finance, I'm doing IT, I'm doing, a, um, I actually with tenants, so I'm a landlord, I guess in theory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a lot of unique things. So I'm not bored because each day we'll have a different type of things that I'm asked to do. And I like, I like that type of work. Uh, some people may be much more rigid. I mean, that'd be for everybody, but I enjoy the, the diversity and sometimes the nuance of the work on a day-by-day -day basis. Yeah. So wh where do you see the state of philanthropy in general, uh, in America and in the world? Are, are, are more people being philanthropic? Is more money being given away, less money? Where do, you, where do you see the future, Ken? Well, I would say more money is being given away for two reasons. First and foremost, I think folks are recognizing you should give more money when it needs to create it. So for example, at the MacArthur Foundation, I had been there six months. So in talking with the president, we, we did a bond offering. So we did a bond offering for $125 million that was up and beyond the normal grant making that we provided and supported COVID-19 and civil unrest. Then we actually, normally we have a three to one match for, for contribution for, for my staff. We did a five to one match. <clears throat> so that meant if I gave hundred dollars, they got another $500. They got $600 for a hundred dollar contribution because we recognize philanthropy has to show itself. And then Part of the challenge that we have in philanthropy, we're, we have to give away 5% of our endowment each year. So some folks say, why aren't you giving more, right? Well, the challenge is we have to make sure we grow our endowment faster than we spend it. Yeah. So last year was a great year. This year has been a lousy year in terms of if you look at investments. <clears throat> now, the other key thing, Adam, to ask your question is that philanthropy is changing. You have a new generation of philanthropy that is like the McKinsey Scott way of doing it, right? She's giving money to different causes right now. Right? It doesn't have all the paperwork or nuance or, or Jeff Bezos. So you're having traditional philanthropy and I'll call it new wave philanthropy taking place at the same time. Both giving away funds, but in a slightly different manner. And I think it's healthy, right? Now we have more restrictions, obviously, because of more traditional philanthropy, but I'm not against folks contributing in different ways. So you're seeing philanthropy even expand in that regard. Hmm. 
And this idea that the, you know, the Gates Foundation, Warren Buffett, the idea of giving most of their money away, you know, before they pass away, is that something that you see as a continuing growing movement? It's a mix. I, I think a lot of the foundations, quite frankly, we want to operate in perpetuity. And the rationale is the fact there will always be new issues that they want to work through. <clears throat> so, so Gates, I think the way it's working, I think 40 years after Bill Melinda Gates passed, they will, um, they will um, leave. Atlantic Philanthropy did the same thing several years ago, they will sunset. <clears throat> For a lot of private foundations, they tend to, at least at this point, say they will operate in perpetuity. Now, having said that, I do believe if a foundation discovered a game changer that could change society, they may change their point of view. So for example, and say if I'm a healthcare foundation, I'll say Robert Wood Johnson, I can't, I can't speak for them, but if they had a gay funding that could cure cancer, right? I think they'd be willing to spend every dollar if it meant that cancer, which hasn't been dealt with for forever and have a, have a solution for that, I think they'd be willing to do something dramatic if there was something to that magnitude. Okay. But outside of that, and then I think for the type of work that's done at Annie Casey and MacArthur, it's really more social driven people issues. And so I think there'll always be something new in the horizon that will continue to determine why there's a need to continue the work. So a lot's really dependent, quite frankly, on the mission of that particular foundation. No, well, thank you, Ken. Uh, it's been a very enlightening and I appreciate you, know, you taking time out of your busy day to talk with me, it's been fascinating. Um, I'd love to get a chance to talk to you again at some point if you have the time. No, I look forward to it. Uh, it's, it's funny when you start this conversation, you asked me why I like philanthropy and to your comment, I wish I knew about this earlier, but to your earlier comment, it wasn't something that was resonating when I was an undergrad or grad school, but I think there's a new generation of folks who are discovering this earlier in their careers and recognize why they enjoy the work. But I, I definitely look forward to the dialogue and any future conversations as well. This is The Black Experience for all. If you like what you hear at The Black Experience, please consider clicking on the join button to support our nonprofit. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Thank you for joining us.